All right, welcome everybody. This is uh, Tom Moore, founder and CEO of CEO Quest, uh, here to talk about Chapter 17, uh, Organization Design uh, for the book Scaling the Revenue Engine. Uh, and it's my pleasure today to have Jennifer Loftus, CEO of Swing Talent. Uh, Jennifer started Swing Talent uh, 12 years ago, and she provides top-tier recruiting support to tech companies uh, all over Silicon Valley and companies well beyond Silicon Valley. Um, she is uh, here today, um, and Jennifer, it's a pleasure to have you. It's a pleasure to be invited. Thank you. Great. Well, uh, let's get going. So uh, this is a very important chapter because it's really the, uh, cha the precursor to the final uh, journey across the bow tie itself. Um, uh, and in this uh, chapter, what we're talking through is organization design. And, and this relates to uh, how we bring together not just the data, the uh, tools, the workflows, uh, but the people that are going to populate the organization that allows you to, to, to scale and optimize your revenue engine. Obviously, a super, super important piece of the puzzle. And so, um, first off, uh, this, interestingly enough, um, uh, uh, while you are hearing um, chapter 17 of Scaling the Revenue Engine, we still have another, uh, what, uh, seven chapters to go um, uh, or so. Uh, I have already begun working on my second book, which is on people design. So uh, I thought it might be useful to bring into this conversation the framework that is underlying uh, that work, which is the people design framework. Um, and I, I think the important point to make is that in the organization design that's going to power your revenue engine, uh, we really have to be aware that there's a set of decisions that I would call decision dynamics around what's the architecture of your organization, what competencies do you need, what responsibilities and authorities and compensation are you going to bring uh, into your organization given your stage of, of, of company and so forth. All those things are decision dynamics. And that's most of what we're going to talk about today. But it is important to understand that um, in the ongoing work that leaders do in, in, in leading their teams uh, that, that you build, um, that's human dynamics. And that's, frankly, where the rubber hits the road, um, is in your effectiveness in, in, in creating followership and, and building high accountability teams that work inside a powerful culture. So with that context, uh, let me provide a couple other uh, context uh, points, and then we'll uh, expand beyond that. So obviously, one of the key questions that one has to ask as we deal with the, the, the question of what organization do I build is, is we have to understand our stage of company. You know, where are we? Are we at the prove the idea stage? We've barely gotten seed funded. Um, are we proving the product? Have we moved up to where we're in the 10, 15 million range where we're proving the market, uh, 30, 40 million range where we're proving the business model on up to hundreds of millions of dollars as we, as we get larger. Obviously, all those things affect everything from the skills you're capable of acquiring and bringing in and that you need at that stage, the pace of scaling, the staffing levels, the degree of specialization, and the amount of resources you have to devote to that. So that's obviously one of the key contexts that we have to keep in mind. The other one, uh, importantly, is the business model. So we've talked throughout Scaling the Revenue Engine about five uh, broad types of business models, very low lifetime value under $500. This is the world of B2C media companies. Uh, this is the world of gaming and, and um, very low cost uh, B, B2B, uh, sorry, B2C um, uh, e-commerce plays and, and marketplace plays and things like that. Um, Low customer LTV is obviously 500 to 10,000. Uh, 10,000 to 100,000 is the mid customer. 100 to 500K is the high customer LTV and then the very high LTV. Obviously, the business model you're in dictates the nature of the organization you can and should build under the principle that you can devote only up to about a third of your lifetime value to the customer acquisition costs. And so if you're at Low LTV or, or, or very low LTV, you're definitely going to be dealing in the world of growth marketing, right? Maybe brand, uh, maybe product marketing, definitely growth marketing. It's going to be either completely automated uh, demand gen or there will be very minimal labor inputs. Uh, as you scale up, of course, labor becomes viable. Um, you're able to spend at very high LTV 
uh, levels, you're able to spend 150 to 200 thousand dollars or more per customer to acquire them. And so here, the world of sales development and and you know high-priced account executives, large customer success teams, and and so forth kick in, uh, and and robust product marketing and growth marketing capabilities as well, of course. Um, so with those factors, I thought it would be interesting to take the example of a mid LTV company and sort of think through how stages of growth can affect things. One of the things, Jennifer, that you, you've talked a lot about um, is that, that we have to conceive of the question, what are we hiring for? Um, and, and you can broadly think of that in terms of people who are capable of operating an existing workflow and an existing team and perhaps scaling that team, right? Versus those who have to create the workflows in the first place hire the first person on that team, get that optimized, right? And so ironically, in some ways, the earlier the stage of the company, the more burden there is to find people that both can create and can operate. So it would not be inconceivable to conceive of a company where in the first stages of uh, the company's growth, the entire sales force is constituted by the CEO. She or he is taking the lead to find every sale, and, 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 and you know, that's, that's the totality of the sales and marketing organization. Um, as the company scales, you might imagine a director of sales creating the first one or two sales pods, right? And so they're, they're going to have probably some growth marketer that is helping mobilize, say, a set of email campaigns, get the website organized. That person's probably also going to be a jack of all trades doing trade shows and other things. There might be a team offshore in India, wherever the Philippines that is putting together some data, uh, uh, you know, grabbing and organizing data that can be used to drive the email campaigns. Uh, there may, uh, those are MDRs being market development reps. There could be three or four SDRs that are driving cold calls and lead follow-up uh, following on uh, the email campaign uh, responses and, and cold calling to create appointments for AEs. Right. One of the core principles, I think, is that, you know, it's so easy to get ahead of yourself. And one of the core principles is as you build those first one or two sales pods, it's really critical to make those successful, to have a degree of repeatability and some trending that's heading towards, you know, a, a, an ROI uh, roughly associated with um, LTV over CAC equaling three or greater uh, before you scale further. Um, and often what happens is people will just plow forward uh, and, and hire that head of marketing as well and begin adding additional sales pods before they've proven uh, the first couple. Uh, and that, by the way, was a mistake that I made in my, in my tech startup, and I, I had to refactor, uh, which is always painful. And so as you scale, you can see how, you know, now we have introduced the director of marketing function, uh, who's now differentiating out that growth marketer, maybe a couple product marketers, Maybe this is a technical product, so we have a sales engineer we've brought in. We've introduced a customer success team. And again, creating and operating skills remain important. And then eventually as we scale, in comes the VP of marketing, the VP of sales that are operating and scaling a pre-existing organization. Um, customer success might come in at a later point and maybe there's more creating that has to get done. But you see the point. As you're scaling, you're wanting to prove your way to the next stage of growth and you're always asking yourself, for the person I'm hiring, am I just needing somebody to operate and scale what's already in place? Or have I got to have somebody that knows how to create, that knows how to envision, uh, to architect, and to build that thing that has to get built? That's a unique set of skills. So as we talked about, there's this intersection of data tools, workflow, and people. And uh, throughout Scaling the Revenue Engine, we've spoken about the capability maturity model, which is essentially about optimizing workflows, right? We've talked about how, you know, stage one is chaotic processes or workflows. Uh, stage five is highly optimized uh, workflows in which the teams are fully trained to use the data that is being presented visually to the workers uh, as to the status of those workflows so that they can continuously improve. And in between, you have the, obviously the middle, the middle steps. And all of workflow optimization can be summarized by the, the, the need to continuously attack the biggest bottleneck. There's always a bottleneck in every workflow, and workflow optimization about, is about continuously identifying that bottleneck and attacking it. So 
when we look in, in the context of, of our marketing and sales world, obviously you're dealing in a place where you, you, you need that the, the people involved have to have well-designed workflows that they live inside. They need to have data visibility, role clarity, clear performance expectations. They need to be able to be coached and to have mutual accountability uh, to be enabled, to have training and support in, in, from an enablement point of view. And then uh, great teams are always directly involved right down to the front line uh, in continuous improvement of the workflows they live inside. And so those are some principles that I think are, are use, useful to think about. I'm just going to throw a few more slides out here as to what the end state might look like. We'll talk a little bit about uh, compensation, and, and then I want to op open it up to, to some of Jennifer's experiences. So in the end state, on the marketing side, you can conceive of a mid LTV or high LTV business as eventually having had a brand who's responsible for all the um, brand identity uh, components, uh, especially the visual expression side, as well as brand campaigns and uh, you know, the trade show stuff and all that. Product marketing, product marketing is essentially about content creation. So you're going to have content specialists and um, supporting the development of all the content related to everything from the pitch deck to the website to the thought leadership campaigns and so forth. Growth marketers, which is usually a highly analytical role in which you're, uh, you know, uh, optimizing around search engine marketing and email campaign, you know, subject line optimization and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then increasingly these days, marketing operations, which is dealing with all the tools. If you're in an account-based world, you're going to have tools like Engageo, um, perhaps interacting with a Salesforce instance, and you'll have Marketo and all these other tools that are floating around. Um, obviously, you need somebody who can coordinate that. And, and make sure the data is flowing uh, cleanly. Um, on the sales side, similarly, uh, you will have a sales operations person uh, that's taking care of um, uh, the, the sales face inside of that equation. Um, and then account executives and sales development representatives, which we've talked about previously, and, and sales engineers. So um, before we go into uh, comp and then open it up to, to Jennifer, there's one key point that I, I want to make. Uh, one of the things that, that I observe often in, in the work that, that I do working with, with CEOs is um, how powerful it is when the heads of marketing and the heads of sales truly see themselves as a team uh, and how really rare that is. So, you know, if churn is low, in other words, you don't have a product problem and sales velocity is not high then we can only conclude that marketing and sales has to own that problem. And really they have to own it together. Um, too often what you see is a blame game. And, and what's, what constitutes a high performing team is a team that understands uh, that the challenge is shared, that when you bring together the right competencies between the marketing and the sales side around a common approach with mutual accountability and commitment and trust, you begin to get to this point where you dissolve the boundaries and people attack the problems together. Too often, uh, what you can see is sales defining the problem as a lead problem, um, marketing defining the problem as a sales conversion problem, and nobody gets anywhere. Uh, what's really powerful is when marketing and sales see themselves as the power partners they are, and, and they act accordingly to work together to continuously attack the bottlenecks. So I'm just going to touch on a couple of um, uh, compensation points. Uh, that these are high level, and obviously uh, there are high variations around this depending on the specifics of what's going on. So I am specifically referring to a high, mid to high LTV company with 10 million in revenue uh, that is a technical product. Okay. So in that scenario, um, you can think about VP of sales being in the 200K range with a bonus of, 10, uh, of 100%. Equity uh, from uh, half a percent to one and a half percent would not be unreasonable. Uh, on the marketing side, you can think in terms of 225 with 40% base, uh, sorry, 40% of base as, as bonus. Uh, equity ranging again from about a half point, maybe to one point. Um, VP of customer success in that 210 base range, bonus is going to be a little lower, say around 30% of base, uh, and, and equity in the quarter point to three quarter point range, and then the director of sales ops in that 140 base area uh, with a bonus around 
And there you can see between um, uh, 0. 0.05% uh, equity up to 0.1% equity. Um, SDRs, AEs, uh, SDR, 50K base, 50% of base as bonus. AEs, 90K base with 100% uh, of bonus as, uh, of base as bonus. Um, sales engineers are really expensive because they're incredibly valuable. Uh, so think of them more in the 160K range and again with a, with a 20% of base as bonus. Uh, and then finally, growth marketing analysts, 100K-ish, 20% uh, of base as bonus, and customer success managers, similar base with about 30% of base as bonus. Um, those are obviously just guidelines, but uh, at a high level, can make sort, sort of can make sense. So Jennifer, talk to me a little bit about some of the things you've ob observed in, in the hiring of, of, of the VP of sales. What are some of the variations in need that you have seen and uh, the types of issues you've seen uh, in, in working with companies around that position? Hmm. Well, many, many CEOs are technical founders and go to market is something new to them. And, mm -hmm. and just to back, backtrack, the first thing I would advise uh, especially technical founding first-time CEOs, which many, many of them are in the Silicon Valley these days, is to find a mentor, a go-to-market strategist uh, outside of the board that he or she has put together um, to really, really be a go-to uh, go-to-market strategist for this person. Um, you know, the partner in crime that you could trust that has done it before. Um, that, that to me is invaluable. I have one myself and I, and I think that every CEO out there should have that person um, as an owning board. Because, you know, as you mentioned, mistake made uh, over and over and over again, um, particularly in a market strategy, uh, hiring a sales leader, uh, marketing leader, and, and on down. Um, for the, the smaller company, you know, 10 million or, or lower, I think sometimes um, they overhire. And so it's really a, when do you need a, as we were saying uh, in a conversation earlier, a presworthy VP of sales. Mm -hmm. And that, mm -hmm. that, that need is often further along down the road than the than people think. So it's, it's really, you know, not to, not to overhire from the get go. Um, that, that's, that's something that I think people really need to, to think about is when do I need the actual, you, you say VP of sales, what is VP of sales in the in right. startup world? Yeah. Right. And, and uh, it, which sort of opens up the, the, the point about titling to a certain degree as well, doesn't it? So, um, sure. uh, have you observed sometimes that, that very early stage companies have like almost gotten out of the gate out of whack with titling? I, 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 I think that titling, if you, if you title a, a startup V of sales, and, uh, you could get in a little bit of trouble and then end up needing to hire an SVP sooner than later. So it's not so much titling. Honestly, it's, it's more the what has the person actually done? Is he or she managing a team or is, is this person still very hands-on? The name of the game is hands-on. They need to be, if you're, mm -hmm. under, if you're under 10 million, you need to be, to be you know, hands-on. If you're over 10 million, um, then, then the job description really changes. But, um, you know, the... In the startup world, zero to zero to hundred means this person needs to have the sophistication to own the roadmap, uh, but also be able to roll up his or her sleeves and and do the job as well. You know, heavy quota carrying, and that's more of kind of a we're calling it a a head of or like a junior startup VP, and then mm -hmm. work with your mentor on when when does the the, the tried and true, they've been a VP 
you know, three to five plus times in their career. And that's always someone that's over 10 million and they're, they're coming in and they're inheriting a, a team um, to take the company to the next level. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. In fact, what, what it leads me to think about is that you, you've got really three things going on. You, you, you've got the, 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 um, the operating aspect, which is just executing through the people that work for you, the numbers you, you, you have to deliver. Um, the, the doing it yourself aspect, which is carrying a book of business yourself or, or being very active in, you know, bottom pipeline closes and making, you know, making sales cross the finish line. Um, and then this, this thing about creating, that, that you're the one that's going to be designing the workflow. You're the one that's got to think through which technology platform you're going to use to support the team. Uh, depending on the stage, uh, you could be very involved in those foundational building blocks. So that, sure. that, that, that combination of skills in some ways uh, is more diverse the earlier you are as a company. And it, it begins to winnow down increasingly towards more operating and scaling uh, as, as you get bigger. Um, ha have you found that that reality, I, I guess, causes obviously a whole different profile? You, you've got certain folks that are just going to be way more comfortable in that sort of do it yourself and create the first instance mode than the guys that are coming in who are able to run a 30, 40 person sales team as an example. Yeah, they're very different, but the Silicon Valley over the last you know, five years in particular is just breeding these athletes that really, really the, 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 the top performers are learning how to do it all. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it, and, and that's the, the days of, you know, just uh, sitting back and building a team um, and managing a team are, are over with these athletes. And they are like incredible athletes. They are learning how to do everything from, you know, a small startup. And then maybe their, their first time being a VP, they've really already built something from scratch as a, as a director and, mm -hmm. and then they, they get into that junior VP role um, where, where they're, they're owning it all. And, do, and they have the, the opportunity to uh, really be that company's tried and true VP, but sometimes they, they stay at that head of level. And, you know, when, when the company gets to, you know, to, to that next stage, a more praiseworthy uh, you know, sophisticated heavy hitter VP is, is brought in. And it's great for companies to, to have the luxury to decide that later on. Um, yeah. Really commun communication is key. With that first VP that you hire, the communication is key, key that, that, that he or she knows that um, the world is their oyster. Make it, you know, if, if, they, they, if they want to be the VP long term, that you know, to really give them very clear goals on, on how to do it. Yeah, no, that's excellent. So one of the things that um, we observe these days in Silicon Valley with the, obviously, um, the intensely high demand labor environment and cost of living and so forth is um, uh, sales development teams beginning to be built remotely. Um, what is your experience about that? What cautionary tales do you have around that? And um, in the recruiting of, of SDRs, uh, that, you know, what, what are some of the best practices in terms of the types of skills you look for and that kind of thing? Yeah, um, you know, education to, to it, the, the in-the-door, uh, ground floor sales role, um, you know, that, that, polished ability to, you know, these, these are people with very little experience that you, you have to have a ironclad interview process to really figure out, can this person handle uh, sticky situations? Can he or she um, read the room? It's over the phone, but you could go read the person over the phone. Does he or she have that? That, that street smart, that social IQ. I mean, mm -hmm, a, mm -hmm. a, a social IQ to me is huge. So the education uh, mixed with that, 
social IQ. And, and you, could, you could sit down with your interview team and figure out how we're going to measure that social IQ. You know, great questions to how they would get out of a client, a, a potential client in this or saying that. Give them three or four questions that, you know, not, not uh, to trip them up. How would you, how would you, how would you handle a situation where a client gave you this pushback? And figure out can they, can they eloquently uh, lead a call to success handling possible uh, situations. And often mm-hmm. that IQ is, is the number one. And, and, and again, of course, education. Um, so so they, that, that, those are the two that I, I tip in when I'm hiring people inside as, as well as recruiters here swing um, that technical or academic IQ mixed with the style IQ is huge and they yeah. have to be even even or one has to be way higher than the other like they have you know and and I, I have you know charts where this person super technical but the social IQ is maybe a little bit lower uh, you know lower than average but there, there, one has to again. One has to be way higher than the other. Um, so, so really looking at those two: academic and technical versus the social IQ. Um, the combination has to be that winning combination. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting that SDR role is such a critical role because in mm-hmm. order to make the economics work for a uh, mid or high LTV uh, company, you, you've got to get mid funnel conversion to be fairly high or at least decently high in the setup of those appointments for the account executives to take from there. And, and, mm-hmm. you know, it, on top of all the things you've mentioned, which I all buy into a 100%, I would add work ethic. I mean, this, this is the kind mm-hmm. of person that's going to be making 40 data calls a day and, it, you know, really needs to be working it both on the phone and with email and so forth. Um, so, yeah. Uh, uh, very good, though. That, that's helpful. And what about, let, let's take a second on the sales engineer role. What are you seeing out there? You, you indicated uh, to me when we spoke one-on-one that uh, for sales engineers, it's just such a wide range because uh, depending on the company, how technical it is, what's being sought. Uh, and you were talking about there's the technical side of the skill set and then other types of skills. Can you take a second on sales engineers? Yeah, I, I think that it really depends on your current sales team, uh, sometimes you, you could handle just the insanely technical uh, uh, SE, that the technical aptitude is so strong that the sales side and the soft skills may not be as important. Um, but then if you're, if you're just starting out and your sales team is still being built and maybe there's some shakiness there, um, Often we have customers, startups that are saying, I'm not risking anything, and they're looking for that real brilliant soft side, uh, soft skills on top of the technical aptitude. And that's, and that's simply why uh, this skill set is, you know, dearly paid. I mean, we have uh, sales engineering, top level, you know, uh, 160 to 225. Sometimes they're making wow. as much as your V marketing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, just a just a a, a skill set that is incredibly hard, um, and and uh, you know the the demand is so high um, that that they you know they and there's ones out there that they're they're just about closing the deal for you. I mean you could find phenomenal uh, SEs. I think when I started 20 years ago, the SEs were just very technical and very little sales skills, and nowadays. Again, that those athletes are being bred, where they're they're asked to do both. Um, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Wow, Very that's wrong. great. So um, let's let's turn to, to to my last question, but it's sort of open ended. And and what it is is over the course of time, you've obviously you've been doing this twelve years. Um, you've seen a lot of sins, <laughs> a lot of mistakes yeah. that CEOs have made uh, in, in their hiring decisions and and things like that. So talk to me a little bit about what are some of the things you've observed and, and perhaps as a counterpoint to that, some of the best practices that you would encourage CEOs to carry forward as they think about building out their teams. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I asked my team this question as well uh, recently, and their answers were pretty, were roughly the same, and that, uh, you know, do not hire based on, hi, hi, do not hire or not hire based on fear. If you're adding fear into the mix, then things just go wrong. So that's really go with your gut. There is a leap of faith component to, you know, to, to any hire, to every hire, even the person perfect on paper and they can, and they just knock it out of the park in the interview process. There's still a leap of faith. Um, so, so really go with your gut. If you're sitting down with this person and you think, I, I, I don't think he or she's a quick culture fit, don't waste his or her time. Go with your gut, but don't, but make sure to, to lead with confidence and, and not fear. Um, and once you have a, a, a leadership team, whether that's a strategic director or perhaps a startup VP or a more tenured VP, I also see a big mistake of the, the leadership, the, the executive team having a real problem with letting go of control. And I think mm -hmm. it, I, I, I'm thinking of a customer right now where the CEO is interviewing, still interviewing, and they're over 10 million. Uh, roughly 100 employees, and and the CEO is still interviewing each and every hire. And the person could be thumbs up three or four rounds. They've met eight people, thumbs up all around, and the CEO shoots them down. And I think that's a that's a fatal fatal flaw in a in a in a leader um, to to have that much control over hiring. So the th three points again is go with your gut. You know, you know your company. Uh, and, and, but also understand there's a leap of faith and to not go into it with fear, to go into it saying, sometimes there's not, they're not going to work out, but I have to make a leap of faith and make this decision and, and get this person on board. Cause my, in my company every day, this person's not on board. My company, uh, is, is feeling the pain and, and also to understand when to let go of, of the control of, of hiring. Um, you know, where of course you're going to meet people, but if, if team across board has a thumbs up, unless there's something glaring at you, I think that you need to relinquish that total control of the hiring. Yeah, no, I think that's really well said. Um, uh, I'll, I'll add just one more, uh, be thoughtful about sequencing and, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and be, so you know, as one who made the mistake to bring in the head of marketing well before I should have, uh, as an example, um, uh, it, you know, uh, in, in, in my uh, previous tech startup, it, I, I, I've experienced that personally. And, and I would say that also, uh, if something's not working, if the product's not delivering you the rate of retention that is necessary for the business uh, to really be profitable and, and successful, don't keep scaling. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Stop and, and fix that problem. And, and, and don't keep adding people because you're going to hit a point where suddenly you're going to have to let them all go uh, or a lot of them. And mm -hmm. that's not good for anybody. So uh, the only two additions I would make is think carefully about the sequencing and timing and, and make sure not to get ahead of yourself too much. Uh, scale when, when the business tells you you're ready to scale and when the, the, the traction uh, metrics are pointing fully in that direction um, and, and not before. Well, and that, Jennifer, and, and that also oh, lends okay. itself with the, the mentor, um, you know, someone outside of the board um, mm -hmm. that could, could help with those, those decisions. And I, I think that's a, huge piece of the pie, someone that's yeah. made the mistakes before, um, yep. that you could, you could bounce, you know, have that confidant. That is, that is so, so right, Jennifer. It, as one who, who plays that role and works with CEOs, um, I, uh, I often observe that once boards have put money into a company, uh, you know, th their, their clock is, is running, and they sort of are in mm -hmm. hit the gas mode. They, they tend to bias exactly. towards hit the gas. And sometimes the data just comes back in a way that says, you know what, we shouldn't be hitting the gas right now. And so That's you're exactly right. right. Having that third party that can sort of say that is, is a good point. Well, Jennifer, mm -hmm. I appreciate your time. And uh, thank you so much for, for being our guest today. It's very informative. Um, uh, 
Thank for, you for, for having me. For our audience, what I'll say is this. Um, next up, we've got uh, the beginning of the journey across the bow tie. So uh, uh, our, our next chapter is, is, is top of funnel, uh, chapter uh, 18, I believe. And so um, uh, the journey continues. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you.